wonderful. Well, it is so great to be with you all, those of you here in the room, uh, those in the parent and baby joining online, Kingsgate Leicester and my beautiful family in Kingsgate Cambridge. It's great to be together, isn't it? Still in January. And I wonder how your New Year's resolutions are going, if you're a New Year's resolution person. Uh, Annabelle shared a stat with me recently that apparently 90% of people who join the gym at the start of January have left by the end of January. 90% who join at the start have left. I found a way to not be part of that 90%, and that's just not to join the gym <laughs> in the first place. So whether you're a resolution person or whether you're not, or whether you sit in the middle and you're like, I don't really know, I'm sure you'll agree with me that this series on resilient is a fantastic way to start the year. So we've been looking at mindsets and rhythms and habits and patterns that can, can help us stay strong when life gets hard. Because life does get hard sometimes, doesn't it? Whether you're a Christian in the room or not, it doesn't matter. Life gets hard. Things come. And the whole heart of this series is that when the hard things come, we will have the strength and the courage, the resilience to just keep on going. It kind of reminds me, when I was young, I had a, an inflatable punch bag. It kind of blew it up. It had water. I didn't have anger problems, um, I don't think. But it had water in the bottom, and you'd, you'd punch it, and it would come back up, and you'd punch it, and it would come back up, and you'd punch it, and it would just keep bouncing back up again. That's the heart of what we're trying to do here together in this series, is that when life comes and it knocks us down, we get back up again. It reminds me of Proverbs 24, 16. It says, the godly may trip seven times, but they will get up again. And over the last three weeks, those of you who've been tracking along, this is your first time, huge welcome to you. You can check them again online. We've been looking at kind of the vertical things that we can do to build resilience. We've been looking at the Word of God. We've been looking at the Bible and how we can read it and soak in it and allow it to shape our lives. We've been looking at how we can see the real Jesus. Not the Jesus maybe we think he really is, not the Jesus that culture tells us he is, but the real Jesus that shapes our life. And we've been looking at how we can find out God's heart for us, our identity, our purpose, all of these things, the vertical connection. And then today, we're going to go a little bit horizontal. Uh, that's not an excuse to fall asleep in church, uh, although if you've just come from a night shift, well done. Uh, but we're going to go horizontal and we're going to look at relationships. And we're going to look at friendships, because I really believe there is something about good, strong friendships that will help us to lead that resilient life. I was thinking about this talk for the last couple of weeks, and I was thinking, what are the things that friendships bring to me? So I made a little list. Friendships bring fun, comfort, help, support, encouragement, challenge, prayer, money, food, food, cars, hugs, kick up the backside, refreshment, laughter, wisdom, strength, and the list goes on and on and on of what friendships bring. In fact, friendships are so great that one theologian, Thomas Aquinas, a very bright man, he wrote, there is nothing on this earth more to be prized than true friendship. That's a bold claim. I think this one followed up is an even better claim. There is nothing better than a friend, unless it's a friend with chocolate. <laughs> Now, maybe there are some things in life better than friends, but friends are so fundamental to our life of flourishing and so fundamental to our life of resilience. Because, you know, I don't have everything in me that I need to live the life that God's called me to do. I need others around me. I need the support. I need the encouragement. I need the strength that when I fall down, I actually have others to help pick me back up again. In Ecclesiastes 4, this is the passage in the Bible where it also talks about two coming together to keep each other warm, which we may well need today. In Ecclesiastes 4, it says this, two are better than one. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. If either falls down, one can help the other up. I've been watching quite a bit of American football recently, and uh, one of the things I love about the game is, I mean, these guys get knocked down like all the time, constantly being knocked to the floor, but, but I don't think I've ever yet seen one of them, when they're knocked to the ground, trying to get themselves up, because what happens is their teammates come around, they lift their hand out, and they pull them back up time and time again. They fall down, they pull them up, they fall down, they pull them up, and that is what friendships can do for us. I wonder if any of you have fallen down at any point over the last three years, last three months, last three days. I know I have. I know there have been many times in my life where I've fallen down and I've needed others to pull me back up. One time in particular, I remember I was in my fourth year at uni and I don't quite know what it was. It might have been kind of a little bit of 
seasonal depression. It might have just been trying to do too much, a little bit of emotional overload or burnout, but I was just a bit of a mess, really. Um, I'd find myself crying for no apparent reason, and, and it was in that time that I got stuck into the Word of God, and that helped. And actually digging in and finding some of the promises and spending more time with God, that, that helped. But the other thing that helped was friends. Friends who I could just say, look, you know what, I'm just struggling. I'm having a really hard time right now. Would you just help? Can we just have a meal together? Or would you pray for me? Or friends where I could just cry and they wouldn't think I was a total weirdo. You know, I've needed that at times. We all need these friendships in our life. And that's my heart for us today, is that we would gain hope that they can come. And we would gain maybe some practical skills to help us build those friendships. Because we'll all be in different place when it comes to friendships. Some of you may have a really strong support group, lots of friends. I have hundreds of friends if Facebook is to be believed, which is not. <laughs> Some of you maybe had close friends, but then social distancing came, and now, unsurprisingly, you find yourself distant to those who you were once close to. Or maybe some of us here, we've known for years that, that actually there's a gap in our lives that only other people can fill. And so we're going to dig into the Bible, and for inspiration and guidance, we're going to look at what I would consider to be the best group of friends that there has ever been in the whole of history. It's not the Fellowship of the Ring, a uh, little clue. It's not the Band of Brothers. It's not Rachel, Phoebe, Monica, Chandler, Joey, and Ross, but actually the best group of friends, I believe, is Jesus and his friends. Jesus and the disciples and the others that he gathered around him. And you know what? This group went through some hard times. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I want to encourage you. Get into the Bible. Get into Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Read the story of the life they live. Life of misunderstanding, of confusion, of injustice, of persecution. They went through these hard times together. So hard. One of their, their members eventually died by suicide. One died on a cross. But still, they came together and they held together. Why? Because they built strong relationships, resilient relationships that could bear the weight of life. So we're going to look at that for inspiration. And I'm going to pull out what I think are four key ingredients to friendships if we want to live this resilient life. Four key ingredients. Now, those of you who know me will know I love food. I love food. And so because I love food, I've started to love cooking. And there's a, a recipe I've made a few times recently. Uh, I think a picture's going to come up on here. Here we go. Look at that. That's what I think I created this meal. I pioneered it. If you think you did, then don't worry. We can talk about that afterwards. But I call this gnocchi with spinach and goat's cheese and pomegranate. Uh, highly original, gnocchi with spinach and goat cheese and pomegranate, and unsurprisingly, it has four ingredients. And so what I'm going to do is use this picture, use this meal, and pull out four ingredients that I know I need if I'm going to build good friendships, and I want to propose that we all need in our lives as well. So ingredient number one, here we go. Ingredient number one is intentionality. And as I dive into my wonderful youth, the future now tote bag, ingredient number one, intentionality. For me, that's the, that's the gnocchi, gnocchi, gnocchi. Someone help me with that. That's the knocky. Why? Because this is, this is the bulk of the meal. This is the foundation of the meal. If we don't have this, then there's actually no point having all the rest of it. And the same is true with intentionality. You know, if we're going to build strong friendships, here's a little secret. We're going to have to actually do something about it. I know. It's crazy, isn't it? Good friendships don't just fall onto our lap. It actually takes time, it takes investment, it takes choices, it takes commitment, it takes intentionality. And we see this with Jesus and the disciples. We see, first of all, they were intentional in choosing each other, in choosing to spend time with each other. Some of them, Jesus came to them and said, hey, come and be with me, come and follow me. And then they had to be intentional in saying, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll respond. Some of them came to Jesus and said, Jesus, I want to be with you. And he was intentional back and said, yes, they were intentional in the choosing. And then, over the next three years, they basically spent all of their time together. They ate together, they slept together, they wept together, they walked together, they talked together. They were intentional about choosing to spend time with each other, building those connections, building those friendships. You know, I've been so encouraged recently to see the young adult community down in Cambridge. I was chatting to one of them recently, and he was just sharing how something beautiful is happening. And it's only really been over the last one, two years, but it started with Life Group. People started choosing to go to life groups. They started committing to go weekly. They started eating together there. And as they chose to spend time together, what they discovered is they actually kind of liked each other 
Oh, it's crazy, isn't it? They actually liked each other and wanted to spend more time together. So the more time they spent together, the more they wanted to. And they'd go out and they'd go on walks, they'd go on holidays, they'd go climbing, they'd do all these things. And, and it's this wonderful circle that begins with a choice. It begins with intentionality of saying, you know what, no matter what your experience of friendships is or has been, whether it's been great or whether there's actually, I know for many of us probably here and tuning in, there's been times when it's like, that didn't quite work out. I want to encourage you to go again to choose to go again. Because if we're going to build this strength, if we're going to have people who, when we fall down, can pick us up, then we need to be intentional. As Zia Deeks, the wonderful Zia Deeks, I call her Mama Deeks, as she says to me sometimes, you got to want to. you got to want to. You've got to want to do it and make those choices. And for some of us, this will require a change in attitude, a change in our minds and in our hearts, and, and actually going, God, would you, would you awaken me again to the beauty of friendship? I feel like I've lost that a little bit. I feel like I've lost the joy that I used to find in friendships. I've lost that desire to be with people. For some, it's a change of attitude. For some of us, we might need God to come and bring some healing to our hearts in this room. And maybe for others, actually, we just need to choose to change our calendar. We need to choose to, in the busyness of our schedule, in the busyness of our calendar, actually go, you know what? There's something about friendships that's important. I'm going to intentionally carve out some time and fill it with people. Rather than filling it with social media or Netflix or more and more and more work, I'm actually going to go, you know what, that space there, that space there, I'm going to bring friendships in. And this is something that Annabelle and I did a few months ago. We were sitting outside a restaurant in the sunshine in Cambridge, uh, food, sun, winning. And we're having this conversation about, about our friendships. And we're actually going, you know what, we've got friends, but... But how good are those friendships? How strong is that connection? How, when was the last time we actually spent intentional time with them? And so we decided, you know what, we need to make a change here. We need to, we, we basically sent our WhatsApp message to this group. We're like, hey guys, we love you. We haven't seen you enough. We need you. We need you. And we also realized in the moment that they needed us as well. You know, there's a great quote by Ralph Emerson. He says, the only way to have a friend is to be one. There are people who we needed to be friends to us, but there are people who we need to be friends to. So we texted them. We said, come on, let's spend time together. We carved out time. And it's a sacrifice. Because sometimes there's evenings and we know we've got something scheduled and we come home from work and we're tired and we just want to turn on the telly. Or for us, we got rid of our telly. We've got projectors. We've got to get it out, set it up, put it on. But we wanted to do that and just sit and chill. But we were like, no, we're going to be with people. It is a sacrifice for some of us more than others based on personality, but we've discovered every single time we come back refreshed, we come back encouraged, we come back strengthened by that time together. So I want to encourage all of us. Maybe you need to do a little bit of a, a time audit. Maybe you need to have a look at your calendar. Maybe you need to think about who, who am I actually spending time with? Who am I building with? Am I actually going to life group? Am I even in a life group? Choose to connect and be intentional. So that's ingredient number one. Intentionality. Ingredient number two is vulnerability. Vulnerability. And for me, that's the spinach. That's the spinach because I didn't used to like spinach. Um, and I didn't used to like vulnerability. I remember when I was a kid and mum would make spinach and I'd get it on my spoon and my fork. I'd eat all meals with a spoon and I'd have my orange juice in my other hand. It'd be like, okay, one, two, three, and I'd chase it down. And, and, but over time, I came to realize that Spinach is really good for you, and actually it can be tasty when done in the right way. And the same is true with vulnerability. We don't like it. Some of you even hearing the words, you're like, oh, I don't like it, but it's beautiful, and it's good for us, and in time, we can come to enjoy it. Brene Brown, who is a researcher and kind of a self-confessed hater of vulnerability, she did some, some studies into friendships. That'd be quite a fun job, isn't it? Studying friendships, and she looked, what, and she was trying to find out what are the key characteristics for those people who have strong, connected, deep friendships where they pull each other up, and she, she discovered, she said, one thing. One key, unsurprising for this point, which was vulnerability. Vulnerability, she said, in order for connection to happen, we have to allow ourselves to be seen really seen. Now, I'm not a psychologist, but I know enough of my life and I've had enough conversations to know that many of us live with this kind of deep fear of being seen, of being really seen. We think if they really knew who I was, if they knew what I'd done, if they knew the type of person I was, then they wouldn't want to spend time with me. But actually, when we choose to make the choice of vulnerability, it breaks that fear because we realize, hey, they're actually just as messed up as me. 
And I don't need to be perfect to be in relationship and connection with them. It says, here I am. This is me. And you know, this is so key, because if we want to build these friendships, when we fall down, we have others to pull us up, then we have to actually let people know that we have fallen down. We can't keep pretending that we're all okay. We can't keep pretending that we've got everything together. That, That walk past, hey, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm great, thanks, how are you? Like, we've got to actually go deeper and choose to go deeper. And this is not something to do with everyone. This is not, I want to propose something necessarily to bring into the social media realm. This is something to do with a few close friends. And this is what Jesus did. Again, we look at his life. We look at the friendships. They made themselves vulnerable to each other. They shared their hopes, their dreams, their fears. Take John the Baptizer, for example. He was in prison and he was, he'd seen Jesus do some stuff, but he was starting to worry and doubt. He was like, Jesus, are you really who you say you are? Are you really that one? I don't know. I'm I'm confused and I'm worried. He chose to open up. We see it. Jesus, before he went to his death at the Last Supper, he said, one of you is going to betray me to his friends. And you see them honestly having a conversation. Is it me? Like, you know me. I'm pretty great. It's not me, is it? Maybe it's you. must be you. And they they were able to be open with each other. And Jesus himself was like this. After the Last Supper, he went to the Garden of Gethsemane. He took his three closest friends and uh, He was in agony. He said, my heart is burdened to the point of death. He was in anguish. He needed his friends to pray with him and they fell asleep. Anyone got friends like that? You want to hang out and they're falling asleep. And he was like, guys, please, I need you. I need you to stay awake. If Jesus needed to be vulnerable with others, then we do too. We need to let down that drawbridge. When someone says to us, someone who we've already got a bridge with, someone we've got a connection, hey, how are you doing? That's a choice. Are we going to keep up the walls or are we going to let the drawbridge down and let them in and say, you know what, actually I am struggling. Actually there are some things going. Let's get past this, oh I'm tired. Let's get past this, oh I'm busy. Like, Let's really share. And again, Annabelle and I have started doing this more and more recently. I've got a couple of guys I've been reaching out to. We've got some friends around us because stuff happens in life. Hard times come. We need those people who know so that they can lift us up. So number two, vulnerability. Ingredient number three, Here we go. This is the goat's cheese, a variety. Because I use goat's cheese, you could use mozzarella, Philadelphia, whatever your favorite cheese is, Sainsbury's mild cheese. You could give it a go if you want, but this is the variety. You know, to build resilient friendships, we need variety. And I love this. When you look at Jesus and his friends, they were were all so different. You had Matthew the tax collector who worked for the Romans. Then you have Simon the Zealot who spent his whole time working out how he could uh, do some damage to the Romans. That would make for some interesting conversations over dinner. You have Peter who was like, come on, he, he could have been like a sponsor for Nike. Like, just do it. Let's do it. Let's get out the boat. Let's make something happen. Let's go do it. And then you've got Thomas who's like, let me think about that one. Let me think a little bit more. I think a little bit more. I'm not sure about that. You've got these guys, they come together. You've got James and John, full of passion, full of life. And then you've got Lazarus, who was literally dead for a couple of days. And then Mary and Martha, two completely different people. But yet Jesus brought them together. And, you know, there's something about variety in relationships that bring, it brings joy and it brings life and it brings fun. You know, the saying variety of the spice of life. It is true. But also it brings strength. It brings strength because, you know, if I, if I only chose to hang around with, and this is a challenge, if I only chose to hang around with young white men who were married, I would have a certain perspective and a certain point of view that would keep getting reinforced and would keep getting reinforced. And I would, I would actually only have a certain pool of wisdom and strength and experience to draw on. But if I will choose to cross the boundaries, if you will choose to cross the boundaries of age, within friendships, the boundaries of gender, the boundaries of color, the boundaries of demographic, the boundaries of background. If we will choose to build with others, then actually we open ourselves up to a whole world of experience, a whole world of people who have quite possibly gone through things like you have gone through, or even if they haven't, they have a different perspective than you have on that. It reminds me of when I was in my teens and in my 20s, and I was addicted to pornography, and and I didn't want to be. I remember sharing with a friend who was also a young guy, and I was like, look, this is what I'm struggling with. He was like, yeah, I'm struggling too. And we were like, great. We're struggling together. And, and there's strength in that, because you're like, okay, we can start standing side by side. We can start praying with each other. What we needed was someone older, someone who'd gone through that, someone who'd conquered that, someone who'd experienced that, who'd said, hey, guys, it's all right. Let me show you the way. And let me help you. You know, there are people around you who can help you with the things you're struggling with. And maybe there are people around you who need 
your help as well. So that's ingredient number three, variety. Ingredient number four is forgiveness. Forgiveness. Now, I'm aware I'm speaking in church, so we're all perfect, aren't we? Yeah, I thought so. We're not, are we? We, we mess up. We mess up in friendships. We forget birthdays. Hey, how's your day going? Oh, yeah, it's my birthday. Oh, yeah. Sorry. We forget birthdays. We, we say we're going to call and we forget to call. I'm just doing all my confession up here. We buy the same presents that we've bought people the year before. We say the wrong things. We don't say something when we should. We mess up sometimes unintentionally, sometimes intentionally. And so if we want our friendships to last, if we don't want all our current friends to become ex-friends, then we need to learn forgiveness. We need to learn forgiveness. And again, we see this in Jesus and his disciples and his friends. He taught on it. The disciples came to him and said, Jesus, teach us to pray. And I love this. He's like, okay, I'm going to teach you to pray. And he said, forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And I love this because the disciples, you can imagine them praying this prayer. Forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sinned against us. Maybe I better go do that. And then I'll carry on praying. And he taught them to pray this way. He teaches us to pray this way. Another time it says, Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times. He thought he was doing great. Seven times. That's a load of times. Jesus is like, a little bit more. Eight, a little bit more. Nine, a little bit more. Ten, a little bit more. Seventy-seven times. Jesus is saying, you know what, guys? If you want to live the life I've called you to, if you want to have connection, if you want to have relationship, if you want strength, if you want people that are going to pick you up, you need to learn to forgive. And then he modeled it. Because as Jesus went to the cross, he was betrayed by his best friends. And we see kind of a few weeks later when he'd risen from the dead, Peter, who'd betrayed him, Jesus probably saw Peter betraying. They were in the same space. Peter was like, I don't know him. I've never seen him. He's not my friend. Get away from me. Can you imagine the hurt for Jesus? But then a few weeks later, he says, he brings Peter close. He forgives him. And he restores that relationship for the whole rest of time. And Peter learned the value of forgiveness. And I kind of wish that Judas had learned the value of forgiveness as well. Because Judas also betrayed Jesus. But he didn't give that opportunity for connection to reform. He didn't give the opportunity for forgiveness to happen and his life went down a different track. Forgiveness is so key. And for me, forgiveness is, you'd have guessed the final ingredient hidden in here somewhere. Forgiveness is the pomegranate. Forgiveness is the pomegranate because it's sweet. You know, if we hold on to unforgiveness, it's like, it's like scattering burnt toast on top of the rest of our meal. It's going to get through and it's going to be bitter. It's like, oh because you lose that connection, you lose that friendship. When you fall down, if there's someone who you haven't forgiven comes to pick you up, you're like, no. No, because you weren't there last time, so I'm just going to stay here. You jog on. When, when we let unforgiveness in, when one of our friends falls down, we walk past and go, you, you deserve that. But actually, no, there's a sweetness of forgiveness that comes. How many of you have ever been forgiven for something you've done? How many of you have ever been forgiven? There's sweetness, isn't there? But there's also the sweetness that comes of forgiving someone else, of saying, you know what, I know that hurt, doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to trust you again, but, but I'm going to choose to let that go. There's a sweetness. But also, this is the pomegranate, because it's hard work, forgiveness. It's hard work. I don't know if any of you have ever tried to, to get the seeds out of a pomegranate. It takes a lot of time, a lot of energy. You cut in, and then you kind of got all these little packages, and you get this white stuff in there. Does that throw that away? And, and it takes time, and it takes energy to forgive. And maybe some of us here today, we will need to take that first step of the hard work that's needed for forgiveness. And as we come into land, I just want to invite the band back because although I said there are four ingredients, it's a little trick. There's actually another ingredient with every good meal. Many of you chefs know this, and that is, here we go, the seasoning. That is the seasoning. Every good meal needs some salt and needs some pepper. And I want to propose to you that this ingredient number five, this is Jesus. This is God seasoning and sprinkling and coming into all of our relationships. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean, firstly, by talking about Jesus together with friends who are Christians. It's crazy the amount of times I meet up with someone who's a Christian and we have this whole long conversation. It's like, did we talk about God once? Bring him into your conversations. Pray together. Those of you who aren't Christians, it's okay. If you've got questions about Jesus, bring him in to your conversations and invite him in. Going back to that Ecclesiastes verse, this is often shared at a wedding, but there's no reason that it it is. It's just about relationships. It's about connection where it says two is better than one 
If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. And then it says a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. A cord of three strands. What's that talking about? It's talking about us and someone else and bringing God right into the heart, wrapped around. Because the reality is that we all need God's help in relationships. We can all choose to take these choices, to be intentional, to be vulnerable, to look for people different than us, to forgive. But actually, like, none of us is going to get it right. We all suck at this sometimes. I suck at this many times. But, but through God's help and His grace, we can grow and we can overcome and we can build these connections together because Jesus is our model and He's our help. He's the one who was so, so intentional. He left the perfection of heaven, came into the mess of our humanity and said, I want relationship with you and I want to help show you how to do that with other people. Jesus is the one who was ultimately vulnerable. He's, he's given us his word. He says, look, read this, find out who I am. This is truly me. This is my heart. This is my desire. And I want to know you too. And I want to help you know other people as well. He's the one who made us varied and unique and who loves that. And he's the one who, because of because of the cross, because of what happened there when he took all our sin and shame on himself, he forgave us and he brought us into a life of receiving that and pouring that out to others. So for all of us here, yes, there are some choices that we need to make. Yes, there will be some things that undoubtedly we need to change, but in the heart of it, let's keep welcoming him in. Let's keep trusting in him because we can't do it by ourselves. We can only do it by his grace and by his strength. Amen. Amen. So wherever we are, we're going we're gonna to respond now. And I want to invite you. Why don't you stand with me if you're able? Also, those watching online, those in Leicester, why don't you stand? And what I want you to do is to just take, we're just going to take 30 seconds. What is it that God's been saying to you? What is it that's been stirring in your heart as I've been sharing? Is there one thing that you want to go away from this place and actually change and put into action? Why don't you just, you might just want to close your eyes. Just enter into this moment with God. Why don't you just bring that thing to mind now? Whatever he's been saying, just bring it to mind. Holy Spirit, come speak. And then with that thing in your mind, why don't you just stretch your hands out in front of you. And what we're going to do is we're going to invite God in to that situation and to all our friendships, all our relationships. Why don't you just ask him now, just say, Jesus, come and fill me. Come into this place. Come and help me. Just pray, just pray in your own heart, your own words. Prayer is just talking to God. He hears you, he knows you. Those of you that he's been speaking to about intentionality, ask him for the wisdom. Who do I need to spend time with? What time do I need to carve out? Vulnerability. Some of you, you need, you need God's healing to come. He's the one who binds up the brokenhearted. Where you've been hurt, ask him to come and heal. He's here. He's the healer. He's the restorer. Some of you, where you're like, actually, I, wanna, I want the courage to step out and actually just build with some people who are very different than me, but I don't know how. Ask him for courage. The Lion of Judah filling you with courage right now, filling you with strength. And then forgiveness, where we need to forgive. Come now, Holy Spirit, give us that grace to forgive. Help us to choose. Bring to mind anyone who we need to forgive, to restore that connection, to restore that relationship, to bring strength. Come, King Jesus, we welcome you in. Just in this moment, there might be some of you here and and actually what you're saying is you're saying, Jesus, I want you to not just come into my relationships, not just come into this place, but to come into my life for the first time. I want to begin a friendship with you. I want to receive your forgiveness and receive your life. If that's you, just with everyone just still receiving, eyes closed, why don't you just lift up your hand, give me a wave. I'd love to pray with you personally. If you're saying, Jesus, I want to begin a friendship with you. I want to start that connection with you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. And then for all of us, those who are responding to that and those who are just responding to the Holy Spirit, why don't we just pray this prayer together? Why don't you just say this after me at least a line at a time. Thank you, Jesus, that you love me, that you know me, that you chose me. 
come now and fill me with your love, with your life, with your forgiveness, with your freedom and your grace. Fill my heart, fill my relationships in Jesus' name. Amen.